I had read a number of trans-dimensional stories. In fact, I had written one or two myself. And I had often pondered the possibility of other worlds or material planes which may exist in the same space with ours, invisible and impalpable to human senses. Of course, I realized at once that I had fallen into some such dimension. Doubtless, when I took that step forward between the boulders, I had been precipitated into some sort of flaw or fissure in space to emerge at the bottom in this alien sphere in a totally different kind of space. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. I'm Lisa, and this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is Season 2, Episode 2, and in this episode, we're beginning a new episode arc exploring the fantasy and horror of the alternate reality. Well, welcome to our first true episode of Season 2. I mean, our first real episode was, of course, our fantastic interview with Grady and Will, but now we're beginning a new series of arcs, just like we did in our first season. And I guess we should mention that the intro came from Clark Ashton Smith's 1931 novel, The City of the Singing Flame. And as we just said, as Lisa said in the opening, our topic for the next couple of episodes is going to be alternate realities. And I guess the best place to start is really a question that we've been kicking around in some of our planning meetings about this series, which is, what exactly is an alternate reality? Because we talk about the term, and I think people use it and throw it around a lot, but, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of meanings that it could have. I mean, we talk about alternate reality, and it could mean, like, a completely different reality, something like the through the looking glass or the wonderland that alice goes to or it could be an alternate universe where you're talking about something like the the tv show fringe or or other things like that or even just alternate history which has actually been getting a lot of publicity lately with a with the announcement of a new show coming out on hbo where you know if the south had won the civil war but it's also been explored by philip k dick in the book that ended up becoming an Amazon original, The Man in the High Castle. And so there are, you know, we've kind of pinned down three different kind of possibilities of what we could mean when we're talking about alternate realities. And I mean, I guess I'll kind of bounce it back to Mel and Lisa. I mean, for me, before I guess before I bounce it, I, I think of in terms of horror, we often end up with things like alternate universes. I mean, Alternate histories can have their own uh, fear associated with it, like in The Man in the High Castle, which I'm sure we'll talk more in depth about later in this episode. It's what if Germany had won World War II? Well, that's that's a horrific idea, especially if you are someone who is uh, Jewish or African-American or any other minority that was uh, the focus of the Nazis' uh, genocide. I mean, I think also the the fear of alternate realities, the horror thing that you know, comes out is something like Stranger Things, where there's this, you know, completely flipped mirror verse where there are these monsters lurking, or even the weirdness of Wonderland with the Cheshire Cat. I've never liked Alice in Wonderland, like the Disney cartoon. I'll just put it out there. Freaked me out as a kid freaks me out now i don't watch it if it is ever on tv or something i will just keep going i i will i don't <laughs> like it i won't watch it it's unsettling to me and <laughs> alice in wonderland is one of those movies that i i legitimately don't like and i mean i i don't find it scary i'm not like terrified i don't have to leave the room if it's on but i just don't like it and i think be- it's because of just how how weird it is and i was actually thinking about this too one of the th- something that I hate because it happened on a show I was watching recently is I really hate when TV shows do dream episodes and somebody's having a nightmare. I hate it. And because everything's all warped and twisted and they'll always do something weird with the camera. There's a, there was an episode I think of the Cosby show where they did it. And I, I don't remember what I was watching recently, but they did it. 
And, oh, it was an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And I, I was just like, nope, I'm skipping the episode because I don't like it. And maybe it has something to do with that uncanny effect that we've talked about before. Or maybe it's just just my own personal t- distaste or personal taste. But anyway, I, I think I've started to slightly ramble. So Mel, Lisa, how would you, <laughs> how would you define <laughs> what makes an alternate reality? <laughs> Well, I, th- you know, it is. Well, it's funny you talking about like Alice in Wonderland and the and that cartoon, or or when shows go off into like nightmare territory because they they do have that. You know, on one level, it's a very trippy aesthetic, but it it also, as you said, is the uncanny. And when you're trying to, because this is the problem that we had when we said we wanted to do alternate reality is immediately we were saying, okay, is it alternate reality? Is it alternate universe? As you mentioned, there are some examples of alternate history. And I think what we came up with is that, you know, there has to be some at least rule where there is, or or there are, I guess, multiple universes happening um, simultaneously and right next to each other. So maybe in the case of an alternate history, like Man in the High Castle, it can't be just that, okay, well, it would be interesting to say, what if this happened? Because it's not a rewriting of history or looking at what happened if something different happened in history, but they realize at some point that, wait a minute, there's another world where the Nazis didn't win. And they're trying to imagine that. And so that's what makes it in particular like an alternate reality or an alternate universe. Same thing with uh, Stephen King's book and then later the Hulu TV show about Kennedy assassination. It's the same thing. It's it's the idea of you can kind of go back and forth and, and these uh, universes are happening at the same same time or at least in close proximity, in close proximity to each other. But... What I think is really fascinating is when you're looking at th- at these different worlds, and, and there are a lot of them, and they're as varied as, you know, whether you're talking about Man in the High Castle or even closer, you mentioned Fringe. Um, I immediately started thinking Stranger Things, the Netflix show, where things are like our world, but different and scary. Um, Neil Gaiman plays with this a lot, and, you know, you think of like a Coraline where you'll have, okay, this looks like our world, this looks like my mother, but something's not quite right. And and then, of course, the big, bad, cosmic horror of somebody like H.P. Lovecraft. And to me, you have two really interesting things going on. It's either the uncanny and the fear that goes along with seeing something that's familiar, but that's just slightly off. And I think maybe that's what, Matt, you were picking up on with the, the fear of Alice in Wonderland, because I can, I can definitely see how that would be frightening, especially to a young child. It's not a fear. Um, it's not a fear. <laughs> it is a fear. It makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the uncanny does that. It makes you uncomfortable. But then the, the other kind of flip side to that is that there's also the unknown and kind of the unknowable of what is happening in this other place. And and so much of fear of horror is found in that unknowable. You know, there's something there that we just can't know what it is. I don't know, Mel, what do you think if we're moving towards a definition of what this is and, and why it's scary? Because it is such a broad topic. Yeah, I think... I, th- I kind of go along with what you're saying, Lisa, that it's the uncanny and the unknown aspect of it. You know, you have this, it, one of the things that Lovecraft said in the supernatural and fiction when he talked about what he called cosmic horror was that there are things that we will we'll figure out through science and it won't scare us anymore. Though, I mean, we can debate about how we understand things through technology and we can still make a horror movie about things like that. But his argument was that as we explain more and more through science, there's still going to be places where we don't quite understand or we don't quite know, and that's what's terrifying. So space, you know, underwater and the oceans, those sorts of things. And, of course, he returned to over and over again, and he was influenced by people who wrote before him, like William Hope Hodgson. But he wrote over and over again about this idea of, of 
something like just well like stranger things like something just on the other side of your wall like you look at your wall and you don't really ever think about what's on the other side because you know I'm looking at my office wall and I know that you know my guest room is on the other side but what if a hand came through and grabbed me you know or a portal <laughs> opened up in it or something so that that uncanny idea of like is that really my extra room on the other side that holds all my books and occasionally a visitor <laughs> <laughs> or is there a monster actually living in there who, if I get in the right wavelength or something, you know, could get me? And so you have those Lovecraft moments where people create devices, whatever, to like make those things visible. And they just, they realize that constantly all the time there are creatures all around us that we don't know because we can't see them. And then, of course, the uncanny, like you mentioned Coraline or never, you know, Gaiman's Neverwhere, where there's a whole other world, like, on the other side of the you know the underground basically this idea that there's there's a whole other world of things that are happening that are underneath us or to the side of us or just above us or through a doorway but the other thing i was thinking while you guys were talking about is how some of the horror comes from the fact that as humans we're curious about these things i think we talked about in the clive barker episode like scholars becoming curious about things and always getting in deep trouble and dying <laughs> and so there are also there's also the idea of what do you do if you discover a door to another place like i would think if i opened up my closet or my wardrobe and fell through it's like a narnia place i would try to get back as soon as possible you know i'm not very brave when it comes to such things but i don't know we're human right we're curious well, I didn't die the first time I fell through the wardrobe or whatever. Maybe I'll go a little further and see what's there. And uh, in the Smith story, City of the Singing Flame, he's a bit on the nose with the moth and the flame idea because it's literally a flame singing a song that's a siren call to make you, like, immolate yourself. But he's just walking along and a gateway has fallen on the ground and he just accidentally steps into it and, like, goes through the hill and ends up on an alien world. And he is scared and he goes back home, but then he goes back because he's curious. And then he gets scared and he goes back home and then he goes back because he's curious. And in the end, it's like he just can't help himself. He has to keep going until something horrifying happens. But he almost doesn't even see it that way. He sees it as his curiosity. And so I think this happens in kids' books, too. It's like this idea of, well, if there is another side, let's go explore it and figure out what's going on. And we either get in big trouble... <laughs> <laughs> or we have some sort of scary adventure and we make it through. But I think the, the fear comes from those that kind of mix of unfamiliar, unknown, and also, well, if this is unfamiliar and unknown, what's going to happen when a scientist probes it and tries to discover more about it, or if someone becomes really curious and tries to to, to go further? Yeah, you know, that reminds me a lot of the 1963 film by Roy, uh, Roger Corman, X, the man with the x-ray eyes. And I hope, and I'm just putting this out there, that I hope we do a full episode at some point on just this film because it's one of my favorites. But it, it, it hits exactly on what you're talking about because in that you have a man who is you know, in a way, in the name of science, trying to, to go forth and, and experiment with what he can see in the world. And, you know, as you can tell from the title, it, it starts with this kind of idea of x-ray and being able to, like, see through things. And, and, and there's a brief kind of joyous journey in, well, let's see what we can do with this. And, you know, let's see which, what walls we can see through and that sort of thing. And, 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 it's a very fun journey at some point, but it turns sour so quickly because he realizes that it's not reversible and it, it only keeps going further and further until he can see the edges of the universe, essentially. Um, and that's enough to drive him crazy. Just, just that extent of his vision and it, it reminds me a lot of what's scary in Lovecraft and, and what you mentioned with like William H Hope Hodgson Mel because it's it's just this terror of I'm not supposed to see this I am not supposed to know this yet I do and it has driven me mad and I think when, when you're talking about parallel universes 
that's something that's really interesting because as you mentioned, it's almost the flip side when you're dealing with a child protagonist. Very rarely do we see child protagonists who are absolutely driven crazy. Although that is starting to change a little bit in some of the more current novels. There are a few with uh, dealing with the Alice in Wonderland mythology where, and, and I can't remember off, off the top of my head that the author but where Alice is essentially driven mad because she can't get back to Wonderland. And so that brings up an interesting question of if you do have these parallel universes and these places where um, the veil between our worlds is so thin, then how is it that we get there? You know, what type of people does this happen to? Who can go on this journey? You know, we've already mentioned kind of the scientists who are actively looking for something about this. This is where you get like the space travelers. But uh, what other type of people can get into it? Well, we've mentioned children already. I don't know. That's, that's a really interesting line of thought, I think, to, to go down when you're thinking about this. Oh, yeah. Well, you were talking about an Alice in Wonderland where Alice goes kind of crazy because she can't get back it reminded me of Shawna McGuire's book Every Heart a Doorway have you read uh, that one yet Lisa I know we were talking about it at one point I haven't it's on my um, to be read list which is embarrassingly long at this point so oh, mine's so big it could kill me if it fell on me <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> hopefully soon I've been wanting to read it but you've read it right yeah, I read it over the summer, and I mean, I was hooked from the very first description that I heard, because basically the idea is, you know, <laughs> throughout the ages, children have been disappearing, and it's not necessarily that they're getting lost or being kidnapped, per se, it's that some of them are disappearing into closets and tree trunks and portals in their door, and you know, kind of like in Doctor Who where Amy Pond's house has an extra door that she can't see. Well, the kid sees the door and goes through it. Or a um, wardrobe. And it's basically like when you read these stories like about the Narnia kids, for instance, and it's adventures and fun. But what about, I think Neil Gaiman actually wrote a story about this. What about the older ones who can't go back to Narnia anymore, like Susan? You know, what what happens to them afterward? You know, what what does that do to them? And, and so in every heart of doorway, you have these kids who have been forced to come back because the world rejects them or because they accidentally fall back through into the real world and they, or whatever the real world is, I guess I should put that in quotations, and they can't fit in. They don't get along with their parents anymore. They're like a completely different person. They either just can't live in either world or they really want to go back to the other. And it could be a really scary, horrible world, but for them it was an adventure. It was a place where, you know, they could kind of become their own individual and so you have this home that's been set up by this woman who went to another you know, world when she was a child and it's supposed to help them deal with the fact that they probably want to go back and they will never be able to and to kind of stave off that madness. And it becomes really, I don't want to give anything away, no spoilers, I guess, but uh, it becomes this really kind of interesting meditation on what is the real world, you know, and and what does it mean, I, I guess, in some ways, that you could go to a place that isn't necessarily better than this world, but find something in it that keeps drawing you back, kind of like the Ashton uh, Smith story that we read at the beginning. It's just curiosity. So, I don't know, I mean, is it scarier and more uncanny to have a kid fall into these portals and have to deal with these things? I think that could be a part of it, at least, because you've got that... <clears throat> naivete of kids where I mean a that could help explain why they are more drawn to being brought to these places because you know they haven't closed off their imagination like adults but also at the same si the, the, the same on the other side of the coin <laughs> you have that naivete in the sense of they are like children are more defenseless because they don't know as much and so you know I, I feel like in watching or reading the lion the witch and the wardrobe there is that sense of like these kids don't know what they're doing you know they they think they're in this magical land where everything is good but there's a, there's a real danger to it and uh actually i also wanted to mention too as kind of a side note that every heart of doorway sounds in some ways very similar to the the trilogy of the magicians by lev grossman i don't have either of you read any of those that is in my to-be-read pile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Very good. Very good books. Um, similar idea in the sense of there is a, I, I like to call it not Narnia <laughs> because it's basically <laughs> Narnia, but uh, they, it, I believe it's called Fillery is the name in, in that series of books, but it's actually visited by, so they're at college age essentially, and they, instead of going to a regular college, go to what would kind of be like a more realistic version of Hogwarts, where magic is very in-depth and there's a lot of study and practice involved and a lot of knowing math and all that sort of things. But then there's also this whole alternate reality sort of thing that they explore and they end up discovering that this fillery place that was written about in a series of books is actually real. But it's like, imagine if Narnia could really seriously kill you at every step of the way, <laughs> and that's <laughs> what this place is. And I, I think about the way they describe, the way Lev Grossman describes it in the books, and I'm like, but kids came here. It, 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 because if this place was real, then the kids were real, and they came here. My gosh, how did they survive this? Because it's, yes, magic is real in that place, and it's far more powerful and whatnot, but man, how did they survive? So, I mean, I, I think having kids be the the people who go through these places, I mean, on the one hand, like I said, they we always do say that they tend to, children tend to be more open. And I mean, you always have those movies where like the kids can see things that the parents can't because the parents have grown up and, and closed off that part of their minds or whatever. But then also it does add, I think, a little bit more, I guess, sense of urgency in the sense that that naivete goes two ways and they're you know not as knowledgeable in the world so it's a little bit more dangerous hmm. yeah you know there is something i guess to the child I, I don't know if you know the kind of child like brain or the child like imagination that's required for a lot of these crossovers into these alternate realities and maybe it is just because as a child, your idea of what the world is is not fully formed yet. You know, so for instance, my five-year-old is convinced that, you know, Transformers are real <laughs> because he's seen a, um, you know, he watches the cartoon and then he's seen a an advertisement for one of the movies and they're not a cartoon in the movie. And so in his mind, well, somebody videotaped that and they videotaped a, you know, robot changing into a car, so therefore Transformers are real. <laughs> um, you know, he's still very much in that mindset, and I think if you think about it in that way, we may have a harder time as adults seeing where the place between the worlds are, is thinner or how you could go into a different world, because in our mind, of course, it doesn't exist. Like we know how the universe works or, or we think we do. And so that closes us off to it, but it, it would take a child's imagination or at least a child's, I think Matt, as you said, naivete to understand that the world is greater than what they know. And so in that way, anything can happen, but that may also get to the heart of why it's so terrifying for us because as an adult, you know, as a kid, they're like, hey, anything can happen. We can cross over into this world. We can op open this secret door and run through. You know, Alice can fall down a rabbit hole and be in this wonderful world. And anything can happen. And it's great. But I feel like as an adult, you know, you're kind of like, wait a minute, anything can happen. Like, we don't know the rules of this universe. And I think that that's one of the things, especially that's interesting, because we've kind of hinted at this, but we haven't really talked about it. We've talked around it. But the idea of when you meet, when you're in a world that's so parallel to your own that you actually meet your, uh, I don't know, doppelganger or something, you know, kind of like what happens in Fringe, um, where all of a sudden you have a, somebody who is you, but because they've been immersed in a different universe with different rules, they're different people. Um, and there's that, there's a different sort of horror, I think, that goes along with that. Oh, I'd agree with that, that that idea of meeting a different version of you that looks like you and is in many ways very much you, but isn't you. I mean, that's, 
I mean, just talk like you, you brought that up and I got a little uncomfortable because I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that one bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think a good part of it has to go with that, that idea of meeting and meeting an alternate version of you or even going into this alternate reality where there could be an alternate version of you. I mean, it makes me uncomfortable, I think, because it starts to make me question this idea of, well, what makes me me? You know, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, we all are a collection of our experiences, but we certainly don't think in those philosophical terms like that very often. Usually we just think, well, I'm me, you know, and I mean, we may change gradually over time, but you don't really notice it. I mean, there, there are moments that you may notice, like that you made a radical change or something big happened. But a lot of the times it feels like. I mean, I feel like I'm the same me that I was when I was in college, which I'm not going to admit how long ago that was. Thank you very much. But <laughs> I feel like overall, I my personality is pretty much the same. But I guess if I really stop and think about it, I'm like, no, a whole lot of stuff has happened to me in that time. And while there are a whole lot of similarities, maybe that's not true. And then if I were to meet this alternate me who may be you know, zigged when I zagged and they're completely different from me. I mean, that whole idea of, well, if what makes me, me is so very precarious, I mean, gosh, you know, like that, I, I don't even want to think like that. Like, oh, if, if I had turned left down a street instead of right when I was, you know, 19, then I would have been a completely different person because completely different things would have happened afterwards. Like that's, no, I don't, I don't even want to think about such things. <laughs> Well, and it explodes, it explodes our entire idea of like a moral system too. Because when you're confronted, when you think about it that way, and you're confronted with like a mirror self or, or a other self, you know, it, it, if you, as you said, are a product of all your experiences and, you know, everything that you've lived through up to this point, then so is that other person. And if they have gone through something vastly different, then you may see yourself essentially doing things you never thought possible. And so it's that idea of, well, how far would it, would you have to go to be able to make this decision? And yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's making any sense because it sounds a bit rambly now that I'm actually saying the words, but... <laughs> I, I'm following um, what you're saying. I totally Yeah, me too. Yeah. And... and Mel, since you've read the book Dark Matter without going... That's what it, I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we talk too much about that, then it may end up spoiling the book for people, but it does deal yeah, with... Yeah, I'm not that. sure. I don't want to spoil it because it's so recent, but... I, I am one who I have not read it, so tread carefully. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to spoil anything, but basically this idea is something that gets explored throughout the book and in very interesting ways in the third act of the book. And that's all I'm going to say about it. But uh, yeah, just, yeah, that it's, is it's, a little bit more, it's a little bit more scientific because it takes on the idea of multiverses. So that's a little bit more information, but still not really spoiling anything. Um, okay. So wait, you but said, I think you see where it's going. You're... If there are multiverses and there's multiple males and I don't know what's going on with them all. <laughs> yes. So, we haven't even brought up this idea, but Mel, you just said the word multiverses. So how does that fit in? If we're if we're trying to define alternate reality, then then what the heck is a multiverse? I will attempt to explain it, Matt. You need to check my quantum physics here. <laughs> yes, my my advanced English degree qualifies me for this. Go. <laughs> All right, English PhD work for me. Um, Basically, what I get from multiverses, and this is from reading way more fiction than nonfiction, but the idea is that perhaps time travel wouldn't be possible because of the paradoxes, but paradoxes don't matter if we think of, basically, if every moment of your life there's multiple iterations of you. So, and the iterations get bigger the more choices you make. So kind of like Matt was saying earlier, when I turn right, somewhere in another parallel universe, if there are multiverses, if there are multiple versions of reality, another Mel turned left. 
you know, or if I went to a certain school, another Val, you know, didn't go or went to a different place. And so the idea is that the small changes, if you're thinking about it as, as like an individual and not a theory, the small changes or the small differences between each of these individuals, you can imagine how it would snowball into a radically, a possibly radically different personality depending upon what a particular male had to, you know, deal with from the time they were a child or what trauma they experienced. Or, I mean, just think about an apocalypse. We talked about the multiple ways that the world could end. There could be like, you know, 20 or more males dealing with apocalypses right now. (laughs) There could be males who never made it to my point right now, I guess. So, I find that completely horrifying. Uh, am I doing a good job uh, describing it, Matt, or am I am I butchering it? I don't know why you're looking at me, but <laughs> <laughs> from my understanding, uh, which again, tempered as as yours is with a, a degree not in physics or anything related <laughs> to science, anything except reading. <laughs> I, I think I, I think that sounds about right as far as the idea of multiverses go. It's uh, yeah, just that idea of infinite possibilities at any particular moment, like uh, down to you know splitting the second down into smaller chunks. Like every nanosecond, there is an infinite possibility of things that could be happening, and so of course there's an infinite number of multiverses that splinter off every second or less than every second and so yeah there's a lot where they'll probably be very in line with each other but just have minor differences and then there are some that could be radically different you know some where my parents never met or my you know great 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 grandparents never met and so you know I don't exist as at at all or you know things like that and so yeah I mean it's a really interesting idea and it's definitely something that when you start thinking about it more and more is Kind of like, you know, looking at pictures from Voyager or the, the recent Cassini spacecraft that uh, landed, like crashed into Saturn as it was running out of fuel. We're taking a picture back and it's like, oh, that little pale blue dot, that's Earth. It's like, oh, when you think of yourself on a cosmic scale, wow, life really is small and meaningless. And then you just go look for the nearest bar, right? So uh... <laughs> <laughs> that that went downhill really fast. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm just saying if, if you think of, you know, if you start thinking of this idea of multiverses too long, it really does give this crazy, like, it really does make you start questioning, well, am I just a pure, you know, piece of random chance? And the answer is absolutely yes. And, <laughs> but, you know, what you do with that is something else entirely. This is not about to turn into Matt's pep talk for why your life matters and embrace existentialism but i guess i guess that whole point of bringing multiverses into this discussion of alternate realities i think that that is where kind of the horror aspect can come in pretty easily where if like i don't know if if either of you have watched the show rick and morty which it, it may not be quite up your alley in terms of its humor but one thing that it explores quite a lot is this idea of alternate realities uh through lots of weird grotesque surrealist humor that's also kind of cynical and hilarious and everything else um but that that idea of multiverse is like there's there's an episode and I, I think it's the first season of rick and morty where it's hard to explain the show uh but the it, it basically rick is sort of a doc brown from back to the future type scientist and his grandson is very much kind of marty mcfly and he gives like their family these goggles where they can watch alternate versions of themselves and morty's older sister keeps like putting the goggles on and seeing nothing and flipping through different dimensions because in most of the dimensions her parents never met or never stayed together because they only got married because they found out they were pregnant with her so it takes this multiverse idea and kind of turns it on its head and you know makes her go oh my gosh there's only like five out of all these thousands of multiverses where i even exist that's terrifying if you think about it you know that's (laughs) (laughs) which is interesting because it's terrifying to find out there are more of you because we like to think we have this core 
personality and I mean maybe we do and it just has variations but yeah I mean finding out in like millions of multiverses that there really is only five or six of you is it's like the opposite end of the terrifying spectrum right which is more comforting you know to know that you have all of these versions of you that are making different choices and to think well maybe you know one version is me is living a better life than I am now or you know just kind of imagining that or that there's only a few of you and you didn't survive, I guess, and the rest of them. I don't, I don't know which is worse. Yeah, I can't help you there. I think they're both uh, <laughs> bad in their own ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is something, you know, Dark Matter kind of made me think about some of the stuff I I've, I've thought about before with time travel because I'm a sci-fi person as well. And so, time travel in a lot of ways is that idea. It's kind of like a multiverse idea because a future you or a past you may have made different choices and if you run into that doppelganger you know quote unquote it's you it's even you on the same timeline but how who who am i uh, i wouldn't even have to be a radically different person but like if i if i talk to myself a future self like 25 years in the future even even the small changes like the decisions that that future me or whatever had to deal with are things that i can't it doesn't even have to be major, but there are things I can't really comprehend. Like, who knows what changes could have happened in the world even in 25 years or in my family or whatever. And so I feel like even though it's me and there's that same maybe personality, we just are changed by things in our lives. And and maybe doppelgangers and time travel and multiverses are the ways. I'm talking a humanist now because I'm not a scientist. But maybe those are the ways that we deal with, one, our fantasizing about a different life, but then it turns out to be really terrifying. And two, just who are we? What's our place in the world? And how does it change me? Because when you're living your life, you're making decisions as they come and you're not thinking about what it's doing to you. But like if you saw yourself from another multiverse where you had to do radically different things or you see yourself from a different time where you had to make different choices, I do think it would almost feel like meeting a different person. And that's like the definition of Freud's uncanny, right? Because I'm looking at myself, but I'm not sure I can relate to myself. Yeah, I I think you just said in much better terms what I (laughs) was dancing around earlier yeah just the uncanny nature of meeting yourself and you don't recognize yourself in that person because you've had to do things that you never imagined you would ever have to do but one thing that I noticed as you were talking because Mel you were you were very eloquent I thought in your philosophy of all this but one thing that we've kind of been dancing around is that you know, we're talking about almost like a time travel or travel between parallel universes where the rules are essentially the same as far as what humans can do. I don't know. At, at the very beginning, we, we touched on the idea of in some of these texts of, you know, how magic may work differently in some of these universes. Um, certainly Alice in Wonderland kind of has that feeling of where you cross into a magical realm, but it can get much, much darker when you're dealing, and we've thrown around this term of cosmic horror, and don't worry, we will go into Lovecraft at some point in this episode arc, but this idea of what happens when you cross over or peer into the other realm and you realize that it, it's it's no longer just humans that you have to deal with that that there are almost godlike creatures that are that are controlling things and that have their I guess for lack of a better word if we're if we're talking about lovecraft that have their tentacles on things that happen in this world and you know that that's a, a completely different type of of parallel universe because it's no longer just that mirror world where, where it's just different decisions that have changed what happens but that there are things Matt it, it remind I started thinking along this line when you were talking about looking at earth as just like a little blue dot and we realize how small we are but that's another type of terror with this type of thing is when you cross over and you realize that everything you thought you were in control of you weren't because we are this just tiny little speck and that there are things that are much greater than than we are out there, you know, just on the other side of the line. I don't know. Does that resonate with you guys at all? Oh, yeah. I think it's it would be terrifying if you ended up in, like, a Lovecraftian 
Hope Hodgson type of alien world where like physics don't work, you know? I mean, I don't know anything <laughs> about physics, so I wouldn't even know. But, <laughs> you know, where the atmosphere is weird and things are strange colors and there's a huge tentacled monster coming at you and there aren't any people. I mean, you're right. I mean, there there's kind of the magical idea, but then there's also like the 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 where our our rules and science don't work at all and then there's kind of mimicking where we are in a way where the people we know are there and those seem to be kind of the the major ways we scare ourselves with these ideas but yeah i mean walking through a wall and ending up on another planet is yeah it makes you seem tiny it makes you feel completely just unsafe because you're not even able to understand what's going on around you and then the lovecraftian idea that the big monsters can transport themselves somehow and our plane you know, it is also really terrifying. Right, you know, that that's one thing we haven't talked about is that we've been talking about crossing over into other places, but we haven't talked about what can cross over. You know, if we're going one way, they're going another way. And, and that's kind of uh, an interesting thing. And that's one thing that sort of Fringe does a little bit, uh, the TV show, you know, with the idea of once these two worlds meet, they're going to kind of start fighting with each other, I guess. But but that's one thing that we haven't even touched upon is that if we can cross over one way, certainly somebody else or something else can come over into our world. And what does that mean? Yeah, I, I agree, Lisa, that it's not just scary that we can get snatched away, but it's also scary that other things could come here. Um, and while you were saying that, I immediately started thinking of Stranger Things. But I know that we want to hold off on some of our more specific discussions about books and, and TV so uh, we might as well just kind of wrap up our, our general discussion about alternate realities here. And uh, listeners, you will have to listen to the next couple episodes to get some of those more specific discussions. And make sure that you watch out for your doppelganger in the meantime, because you don't know what they've been through. Thanks for listening.